What's up everybody, I'm Jesse, or Game Over Jesse as y'all may know me, and here with me today I have Mike. Why don't you go ahead and let them know who you are, what you do, and why you're so special. Hello, uh, so I'm a writer at The Tonight Show uh, with Jimmy Fallon currently. I'm also a stand-up comedian. I've written for The Onion and IGN, and before a lot of that, I was a writer-editor at Nintendo of America. I was in the localization department in the Treehouse. All right, so you mentioned that you used to work at Nintendo. What exactly did your job involve there? Uh, My, what, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, like, what kind of uh, projects stand out to you more than others while you were working there? The, the biggest project I worked on was Kid Icarus Uprising. I was one of the, I was sort of the secondary lead writer on that. So they had two writers and two translators on it. Um, we wrote, like, dialogue. It was one of the, it was one of the biggest, I think it still is, the most dialogue in a Nintendo game ever. So it was a new project, and there was like a lot of like you know uh, figuring out how we were going to do that. There was table reads. There was just you know there hadn't been that much dialogue I think since maybe something like Star Fox sixty four. So a lot of the fun of it was getting together and doing table reads and rewriting jokes because it was a very comedy focused game, as uh, Mr. Sakurai intended it to be. So uh, there was just like a lot of comedy writing in it. There was like you know going to or uh, you know listening to the voices and like hearing how you know, people coming out of the studio, what they had made. Um, so it was a really fun, interesting experience. Also because, like, we got to sort of, in a way, break new ground at Nintendo, uh, for Nintendo, you know, uh, to be part of a project that they don't usually do. Right, and with the whole translation process, were there was there any difficulty uh, trying to make the jokes work? Maybe the Japanese writing had some jokes that didn't quite work with well, the American language or English. I mean, that's the whole job of the local uh, localization team. A lot of people, I think that especially recently, there's been this false view that we go in and we, you know, kick down the door and then we change the game from what the developer wanted, and that's. It's not the case at all. At least when I was there. I mean, I can't. I don't speak for the company. Obviously, I don't speak for the company now, and I don't speak for them at that point then. But in my experience, first of all, most people in Japan speak English. You know, they speak it. They take it in school. They speak it as a second language. Our job isn't, you know, to just put it in English. Our job is they want us to make it make sense. So, you know, we'll, and I work with a translator. So it's not like I have a dictionary and I'm going through the game being like, what does this word mean? Okay, whatever, and I'll throw it away. We have a translator who will be like, okay, um, this character speaks with an accent that comes from this region of Japan. That sounds maybe a little rough. So maybe we'll give them like an old-timey Brooklyn accent. You know, so the idea isn't to change the game. It's to what's the closest we can do to get the meaning of it, you know, because the problem is if you do a direct translation, a lot of things just don't make any sense. You know, and I know that fans say, well, that's what I want. Yeah, but a lot of people aren't, you know, hardcore, you know, fans of Japan who understand what every region is and who understand, you know, even little visual things. Like, sometimes there'll be, like, something about someone's outfit, which isn't even verbal, but, like, if you, you know, in America, sometimes you'll see an outfit and you'll know something about them from, like, if you see a businessman wearing a certain type of tie or, like, an America pin. Oh, he's a politician. Just little... Uh, cultural signifiers that you just won't understand unless you're from Japan. So part of our job was to like look at characters and not change them like, again, I, I, I never ever when I was there had something like, oh, she's too sexy, we need to change her, or we need to like remove her boobs or something. That never happened. What was it was like, okay, uh, this character is the captain of his high school team and he has a red armband. Uh, well, Americans don't know that makes him the captain of his team, so how do we convey that, if that makes sense? Um, so it's, it's, it's about trying to get as close as we can to their vision while still making it understandable to a large audience. So um, were, was there ever any real pressure on you like once, once the game comes out, whether you may have missed something or your team may have missed something or just how well it was uh, looked at and reviewed? Well, weirdly, Icarus came out after I was gone. Uh, it, both, both Icarus, I think, did Icarus come out after I was gone? I know Mario Party 9 did. Uh, which I also worked on. I also worked on Mario Party 9, which was a lot of fun, and we can get into that. It's weirdly fun to work on Mario Party games, and I'll tell you why. Uh, once we get into that, there's no pressure like that. I think that, you know, I think that, you know, if, if you miss something, or let me back up. Um, you also have people over you that play through the game a bunch of times as you're writing. So there's people who go, okay, this was, you know, I, you know, you made a grammatical error here, or, you know, or, you know, we have senior translators who will play through both versions of the game and they'll say, I think you missed something. You know, so there's just a lot of, like, um, 
there's a lot of checks and balances there. And the developer's playing the game as we're translating it. So the developer will say, we don't understand why you changed this. Could you explain it to us? And if they're not happy with it, we'll change it to something that makes them happier. Um, it's a very, at least at Nintendo, again, I don't speak for companies like Atlas or, you know, whatever. But at Nintendo, the developer was constantly involved. Right, so there's like a lot of checks to make sure. Yes. Okay. That's good to know. Um, yeah. Now, you, you mentioned Mario Party yeah. 9 as another game that you worked on. Uh, that was fun. What, what makes the Mario Party games so much different? Because um, you get to name the mini games, which are all like puns. So you get to sit in a room with a lot of your friends who are other workers and go, okay, what do we name this? And for that, I think, you know, it, it's, you know, you'd see what it is in Japanese. And usually in Japanese, it's like a pun or something. And you try to make a similar pun. Um, but a lot of the fun is like, you also get to play it. So like, you know, you'd sit in a room with other adults playing Mario Party being like, what should we call this? And it's just so much fun and there's so much joy in the process and the Japanese team is having so much fun making it. Also, I feel like Mario Party 9 was a good one um, of the series. I know that, like, there's different views. I know everyone loves Mario Party 2 and will never get over how good Mario Party 2 is, but um, it was also nice to work on a Mario Party where I was like, oh, this is, I'm enjoying this game. You know, because... You know, I again, I don't speak for the company, but I'm sure there's also been people who have been assigned to games that they did not like playing, but had to work on because they're being paid to. Um, so it was a lot of fun, and the team was having fun making it. Um, and, Mar and, and Icarus was a lot of fun, too, but Icarus was like, you know, Mario Party's like, you know what Mario Party is, we're putting it together, name some stuff. Whereas Icarus is like, we're, we're rebooting an entire series. <laughs> so it's also less pressure to work in a Mario Party game. You still want it to be good. You want it to live up to Nintendo standards, but it's less like a, like, there's, it wasn't like over a year and a half. <laughs> a lot of the people that come to my channel, they come here for Zelda news or yeah. Zelda theories, and with Zelda Wii U being one of the main focuses at this E3 for Nintendo, were there any Zelda games that you had any help with uh, the translation process or working on? I helped with uh, Skyward Sword. Um, a little bit. The thing is, uh, at Nintendo Localization, they'll have what's called naming meetings. And what that means is, you know, it's like, okay, we want to name this character. In Japan, his name is this. We haven't quite cracked it yet to have a good equivalent. And a lot of the time, again, it's just like, you could give it the direct translation, but again, a lot of the time, like, in Skyward Sword, for example, I named the character Groose. And I'm very proud of that very small thing. Because in Skyward Sword, all of the names of characters who weren't Link and Zelda were supposed to be sort of bird names. It was sort of, sort of like hint that they were birds. And if you do a direct translation of the Japanese, you're not going to hear it. And to, you know, and I think for Nintendo Japan, I understand, and I do understand that some fans want that. Some fans just want the direct Japanese name. But I think Nintendo of Japan and the developer really want international audiences to have their own experience similar to what the Japanese players are. You know, and I should also say that there's also uh, French, Amer North American French, uh, North American Spanish translators who are also doing the same thing while I'm doing that there, or while I was doing that. So, like, they're also coming up with puns in Spanish, puns in French. And, you know, so they're also having fun with it. Um, so with Groose, we had a big naming meeting, and they couldn't crack him. They are like, we want somebody... We want him to come off as kind of a jerk, but also have a very bird-like quality. And so, like, in my head, I kept thinking Bruce as sort of like a, like, a, like a jerk name. And I was like, and I thought of Bruce, and I thought of Goose, like a goose. And I was like, oh, what about Bruce? And they were like, all right, yeah, let's go with that. And it was like, and it's such a small thing. Like, it was probably like a 20-minute meeting, but it's still like, oh, I named a Zelda character. Um, uh, so, and that's how it, and it was also like, they would have, like, whiteboards where they'd write on a ton of ideas. Um... It was really, it was that, naming meetings were always fun, but they're always, like, very, like, because then that name gets sent to Japan. It gets, uh, Japan thinks about it, then we send it to the legal department to see if anyone else has used that name before in something else. So there's also a huge chance that they'd love that name, but then somewhere in the process it just wouldn't work. The thing with Groose is, even though he was an NPC in yeah. Skyward Sword, uh, he was also... He just happened to be one of the main NPCs. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he actually had a lot to do with the actual story. Yeah. So it's it's nice that it wasn't just some I don't want to say throwaway character, right? But some it, shopkeep. It, it, yeah, it was someone that actually stuck with people. Yeah. And uh, he always gave me the impression of like a Biff Tannen stereotype exactly. from Back exactly. to the Future. 
I'm I'm very proud of myself for it's it's funny because I'm not proud of myself for a lot of things. Like I'm like I'm like yeah that was cool, but for some reason naming a Zelda character has always been like this weird highlight of my career. Before we get off the topic of uh, your experience with Nintendo, are there any standout, any other standout moments or any exciting things that you either learned about or that happened that uh, yeah. went on while you were there? Uh, sure, a couple things. I saw Mr. Sakurai speak, ob- uh, bef- obviously before he passed. Um, I saw him speak, and seeing him speak was really powerful. Um, he really cared about the company, and it was really impressive to see him in person, you know, um, also, I, he gave the speech like in English. Like he wanted to, he wanted to, you know, touch. He wanted to be part of the the whole community of Nintendo. Like he wasn't using a translator, even though Nintendo translators are crazy good. Um, it was really great. I also saw Mr. Kamishima before he took over for Mr. Sakurai. He used to work out at Nintendo of America. They have a gym there, and that dude is buff. Uh, I know that's weird Nintendo trivia to know. It doesn't really matter. But that dude is like, he's like, I don't know how old he is, but he looks like an older man. But that dude is like made of stone. Um, uh, so, and the other cool thing is like at Nintendo, like executives would work out at the same gym you were using. Like everyone, you know, Nintendo's not Microsoft and it's not Sony. It's a relatively small company. You know, when you think about it. Yeah, I have a few friends that have uh, a few different jobs at Nintendo. Yeah. And they always talk about how not... I wouldn't necessarily say it's a family over there, but it's not just you have a coworker. It's like it's, everyone's friends. They're hanging out, talking. It's great. I mean, I I left to go pursue comedy, but it's absolutely one of the best places I've ever worked. They treat people awesome there. Um, you know, like it's it's a it's pleasant. It's nice. They have a football. They have like a football slash soccer field that you can play on during lunch. When they tore down, that's another cool thing. I started at Nintendo when they had just got a new building. And they were going to tear down the old building that they'd had since, like, the dark era. And um, been, before they tore it down, they had a paintball game in that building. So they emptied it out of everything before they demolished it. And they had, a, like, an official paintball game. And it was awesome. Like, Reggie, I think, played paintball. Like, it was, it was great. Yeah, I, I've heard uh, some rumors from people that have mentioned that before. It's confirmed. Rumor confirmed. <laughs> well, I mean, have you ever played, like, an FPS and they have a level in an office? Yeah. It literally felt like that. Like, you were hiding behind cubicles and shooting at people with paintballs. By the way, I hate paintball. It hurts. That was my first time paintballing, and probably my last time, but for the only time I'll do it, it was an amazing experience. All right, so uh, you said that you left to pursue comedy. Was that yeah. also something that you were working on while you were still at Nintendo? Yeah, it was actually part of what helped me get hired at Nintendo. I'd been doing stand-up before that. I'd done some freelance writing for... Uh, Saturday Night Live, I'd written for The Onion, and so I think uh, I, had a, I knew somebody who was working at Nintendo at the time, and they were looking for somebody to, you know, do some comedy writing. I think that they just wanted to sort of diversify, because I think a lot of people who work in video games are good at writing dramatically. You know, they like writing role-playing games, you know, things like Fire Emblem that are very serious. I think comedy writing is a little rarer in terms of the skill set that people bring to games, so I think they wanted to bring that in. And uh, so, yeah, so I did that, and I was still doing comedy. And I think after doing Kid Icarus and Mario Party, I was like, okay, I've really enjoyed this. I just wanted to see what else was out there for me. Right. So there wasn't, like, a conflict of interest where you were writing for them, but you were also writing jokes and stuff for your own use? Was there well, any... Uh... there was no... Uh, there wasn't really any conflict. I mean, like, I wasn't... After I started writing for them, I didn't write for other people. Um... Even though I'd, like, I didn't write for like game sites or anything like that. I think since it was at night, and since I didn't mention or have any sort of endorsement of Nintendo while doing it, like it was like two separate people, kind of. Right. Uh, they were they were okay with it. All right. All right. So uh, with now we're recording this just a few days before E three officially starts. Yeah. Is is there anything that you're excited about, whether it's from Nintendo or Microsoft or a third party yeah. developer? Uh, I'm interested in Zelda. Obviously, I want to see, you know, I my friends at Nintendo don't t- tell me anything. So anything I see you, that you're seeing for the first time, I'm also seeing for the first time. I really want to see Zelda. I want to see um, what they do with this open world concept. I want to see how it's executed. I want to see what it means. I mean, honestly, like, Link, uh, uh, you know, uh, Between Worlds was one of my favorite Zeldas. And the fact that you could play the dungeons out of order was a huge part of that. 
you know? And I just want to see that on, you know, Link Between Worlds was like this tiny little game. I want to see that on this giant Skyrim level. Right. And um, this, this is their first official game that yeah. they're releasing in HD. Which uh, is nuts! They've, yeah. Like, they've, they've had a few remakes, but that's right. it's mostly the same thing that we played before, just looking a little clearer. This is the first one that's built from the ground up. And if you right. go back to their last console Zelda game, which was Skyward Sword, there was no Hyrule field. So right. that level of exploration was strictly set at those different territories. There wasn't like a, a huge expanding world that you could just travel through and look for things. Right. So I'm excited for this as well because just from the images and the gameplay that we've seen, it looks much more massive than anything that we've seen from any other Zelda game. Which is which is awesome. I mean, it's awesome to see them try like trying it, and I'm excited to see it. You, you know, what, like I know people are like mad that like you know they're also working for it on the NX. I it's a business decision. I get it. You know, yeah, it was uh, the way that I look at it as I know there was a lot of people that probably bought their Nintendo Wii U's just for that open world Zelda game. Right. But if it's coming to the NX and the Wii U, you're still getting what you paid for with the Wii U. You're still getting that Zelda right. game. And uh, with the NX, it could be just an exact port made for the NX, or it could be an enhanced version. Instead of playing right. in 720p or 30 frames a second, it could be 1080p at 60 frames with like a larger draw distance or something. So right. You're getting what you would have gotten, but if you want to upgrade in the future, then you can get the same experience, just a little bit better, yeah. possibly. And also, like, I, I feel like I got, I definitely got my money's worth out of my Wii U. Like, whenever people complain about, like, the Wii U not having enough games, I'm like, there's there's so many good games, there's so many good indie games. Uh, like, you know, uh, was it Neo Racer or something like that? Like, like that's basically F-Zero. It's not F-Zero, but it's basically F-Zero. I mean, uh, Dot Arcade, which is, I know nobody played Dot Arcade, but it's a $5 eShop game that, like, I've definitely just played because I was bored for 20 minutes. There's so many, I feel like so many people who are disappointed in the Wii U haven't dug deep enough. And that's, you know, obviously, you know, there should be more things on the Wii U, and I know that, you know, some, I wish that there was more third-party support, but I also feel like I'm very happy with the money I've put into it. Yeah, I, I feel if you're buying a Nintendo console, then the reason you're buying that console over Sony or Xbox is right. for those first-party games, which exactly. we had. We we had a great uh, 2D Mario game. We had a great 3D Mario game. We had right. Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, uh, some of the best Zelda games being remade for the system. Yeah, and then you could go back. Uh, they released Ocarina of Time, A Link to the Past, and all these other Zelda yeah. games from the eShop, so you can go back and have all your old nostalgia-filled games, but you also have all these new games that actually take advantage of the tech and the gamepad. Yeah, and S Splatoon, Mar and Mario Maker, you know? Um, I would love to see, I mean, I don't want to see a new Splatoon right away, but I'd love to see more of Splatoon. I'm sure we will. Um, and I'd love, to, God, I would love to see a Zelda Maker. That's what I want to see. I want to see, I want to see like a 2D Zelda Maker. I don't know... Because I don't know, again, I don't know anything. That's not me spreading rumors, because my friends at Nintendo and I have sort of like a don't ask, don't tell agreement. Um, but that's like what I would like, if they announced that, I would just explode. <laughs> well, I, I remember reading like old articles and interview where Nintendo uh, has mentioned that whenever they first started developing the original Zelda, the Famicom disc system, yeah. uh, part of it was supposed to make use of it where it had a dungeon creator where you yeah. could go in, create your dungeons, and share it with your friends, but they thought it would be too complicated for the audience to actually use and take advantage of. But now that they've experimented with the Mario levels, which right. I think would be just as complicated as building uh, a retro 2D dungeon for Zelda, I think maybe with the success of that game, it may spark the ideal to go back and revisit that style of gameplay. It'd be so great. Or something. I mean, they always... The nice thing about Nintendo is sometimes they make weird decisions, but also sometimes they, they're like, they do something and you're like, oh, yeah, please, yes, of course. So I'm always happy with that. Right. Okay, so uh, moving off of video game related oh, yeah. questions and on to right now you're working, writing for Jimmy Fallon for right. his show. Uh, how did that happen? Did you 
uh, get that job from a friend, or did you move up from a different job, or how I, exactly did it come about? I had freelanced for, I would written for a couple of award shows, and I was writing for IGN at the time doing comedy videos, and I did something called the Montreal Comedy Festival, which is this big, big comedy festival, sort of the big, the big world comedy festival, and I did really well in that. Um, and that got me noticed. It was also the 2012 election, so I was just tweeting jokes about politics. And I think that Montreal and that, um, it got me an interview. And they were sort of like, okay, well, we need a writer. Do you want to come and interview? And I did. And uh, I did some research. And by the way, Jimmy's a huge Zelda fan. Whether or not, and I don't mean that like as like a, he likes Zelda, like Zelda is his favorite game. Right. Um, yeah, it I might remember, be, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, no. but I remember when they were showing off Skyward Sword for the first time. I believe it was Reggie and yeah. someone else went to his show and yeah. they showed off like the motion controls and everything. And it, it looked like Jimmy just had a blast playing it. He was kind of joking around, like swinging the sword, yeah, kind of yeah. hectic and stuff. And I thought that was really interesting uh, because that was when I first found out, oh, he actually likes Zelda or yeah. Nintendo games and stuff. He's a huge Nintendo fan. He plays Mario. He plays. He still plays Mario Kart 8 a lot. Now I think he's playing, plays a little more like Rocket League now and some other things. But, you know, I mean, like, he still plays those things. And um, so, like, I talked about it in the meeting and they talked to me and... You know, they liked my writing sample, so they hired me. Uh, whenever you get that job, there's a lot of celebrities and popular, well-known people that come in and out. Who Has there ever been someone that came in that you're just like, oh my god, that's whoever? Like, whether it's The Rock or a um, singer or somebody. I think Weird Al. Seeing Weird Al in person, because as a kid, like, especially as a comedy writer, you know, like, I grew up with, like, Weird Al music. So to see, like, you know, so, like, and he made me laugh so much when I was a little kid. So to see someone who, like, did that for me as a child and be like, hey, I work here, and him be like, oh, you know, great job, it meant a lot to me. Um, you know, there's also been, like, you know, I've seen, you know, a ton of people that I've been lucky enough to see. I've, you know, yeah, I've seen The Rock. I've seen Justin Timberlake. I've seen, you know, I saw, you know, Paul McCartney rehearse. You know, I've seen Madonna rehearse. And, and those are all really cool experiences. Yeah, and uh, just the other night, the president was actually on the show. Uh, are you able to talk about that and how that experience was? Whether sure. it was hectic or it whatever? was it it was hectic. It wasn't really stressful. It was just like a lot of work because we wanted to make sure to have a good show for him. But it was it was very cool. I mean, like he was security was very tight. You know, I had to uh, have my bag searched by the Secret Service. So he's like going through and seeing like you know like a 3ds and like you know like a bunch of games and like a Vita and like a it's. Because I always pack like I'm going to grandma's when I'm at work, even though I'm an adult. Um, but no, but I mean, it was cool. I got to write a joke that Jimmy, the president didn't read the joke, but Jimmy read the joke to the president because they, they, they both did thank you notes. So like, you know, the president did three and Jimmy did three. And I wrote one of them that Jimmy used. So, you know, it's weird. It's weird to have written a joke about the president read directly to the president. Yeah. What, was there uh, like a, a more strict approval process for the jokes to be aired on uh, this episode considering the circumstances um it was it was definitely like they wanted to get the best ones it wasn't st like we weren't like you know strict yes but it wasn't strict in the negative connotation like we weren't yelled at or anything like that it was very like you know just try to do your best and they didn't pick as many as they might normally pick just because they wanted to give him you know uh for that show the best possible quality they could but they were very cool about it and like you know, as tight as security was, they were they were very polite. Like everyone there was very nice. Um, it was a really cool, positive experience. Yeah, because uh, one thing that I was thinking of is like it would the worst situation would be for like whoever your boss would be or someone to come up to you and like pull you to the side and be like, President Obama was offended <laughs> by your joke. Yeah, <laughs> we we were sure not to do that. Uh, uh, it would have been interesting if that happened, but we are sure not to do that. And, like, all we got were, like, good responses overall, which was nice. And the ratings were really nice, which is also nice. Right. So I've seen you come on uh, several podcasts before in the past. I've heard about others that you've been on. Is, is there any podcasts or projects that you were working on outside of uh, the Jimmy Fallon show? Yeah, yeah. I work on a podcast called How to Be a Person. I, I host it with another comedy writer named Jess Dweck. Uh, she and I both are we're very awkward people, so we want to do a podcast where we have friends who are good at things come on, talk about how to make friends, how to live in another country, um, how to uh, 
you know, keep in contact with friends that you don't talk to very much. A lot of stuff in some episodes are just like goofy things. In some episodes, we've left being like, oh, I actually really learned something. So, yeah, it's just How to Be a Person. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud. You can find it everywhere. All right. And you also host your own uh, streams on Twitch. I, I host my own streams on Twitch that I'm very bad at sometimes. Yeah. What are uh, some games? Uh, well, first of all, if someone wanted to find you on Twitch, how would they be able to look? you up or search for you and whenever they find you what could they expect to watch um on twitch you, you can find me on twitch and twitter at mike drucker so m-i-k-e-d-r-u-c-k-e-r on both um on twitch i tend to play older games um sometimes i'll do like you know something new i like to play older games and indie games but basically i have a bad habit of buying new games for no reason other than they look good because when it's five dollars it's like sure i could throw five dollars at this garbage and so then I'll go on Twitch and I'll be like, watch me play this garbage. And, some, and, and sometimes it's that, and sometimes it's old classic games that I love. I like playing rhythm games a lot, so I'll play things like Rhythm Heaven, um, which is another game I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to the Rhythm Heaven re remix on 3DS. But yeah, so it's like rhythm games, music games, uh, old games, and just super hot garbage. <laughs> right. Uh, are, are you, uh, like, actually, is your... How can I word it? Is your Twitch just something that you goof off with, or is it something that you're actually looking to grow and sort of not have a second job, but right. have a large following for people to come and see you play? Um, I think I'd like a large following. I think that I'm too busy right now to have the, um, the regularity that sort of breeds a, a good following. I think that if I ever sort of figure out a schedule where I have more time, I'd like to do it regular and turn it into a thing. But it's also like you know, one of like five projects I'm working on. So it's hard to, it's hard to prioritize that, but eventually I'd really like to. Yeah. All right. All right. So between, uh, your work, the podcast going on Twitch and everything else that you do, uh, how does Mike Drucker relax when you come home or when you <laughs> actually have free time? How do you sit back and relax? Um, I, I play, I usually play video games. I read a lot. Um, I'll try to play video games that I really actually want to play. You know, like I'll play, like I've been playing the new Doom, which I really like a lot. Uh, Overwatch, which I really also like a lot. Uh, um, yeah, I'll try to play games. I try to get through. I have such a large backlog that I need to get through. Um, you know, I'm still, God, I, I'm still behind on Fire Emblem. Uh, so yeah, I try to get through my backlog and I read and I watch Netflix. Um, I tend to be a home buddy just because I'm so busy doing everything else that I like to like stay in. Or I have something what's called a barcade in my area, which is they have uh, like like an awesome arcade that's in a bar. And it's not like there's a few arcade games. It's like more arcade than bar. There's just a bar there. Um, so I've been starting to go there a bit just because it's fun to like, you know, play old arcade games. All right. And um, before we go, I want to touch on your uh more on your comedy career with your stand-up yeah. and stuff. Recently, uh, you performed with uh, the Kind of Funny guys at yeah. Kind of Funny Live 2 in San Francisco. How was that experience, and do you have any other standout moments uh, with your stand-up career? Sure. Um, that was awesome. They were great. The crowds were great. Uh, they were so cool. Like, you feel like, like Greg's audience makes you feel like royalty. They're so nice, and they're so cool, and they're so friendly, and they're smart, too, so you can do smart material for them. Like, you don't have to dumb it down ever for his fans, um, which is awesome, because, you know, sometimes you go on the road, and you have to, like, pull it back a little bit, uh, but his fans were awesome, and his fans, I mean, all of their fans. It's not just Greg's. It's, you know, Greg, Colin, Nick, Tim. Um, yeah, so it was great. I mean, I, I met Cisco there, which was weird. Cisco of the Thong Song fame. So, um Outside of that, stand-up moments from stand-up, I think the first time I did stand-up was crazy because I'm such a nervous person that the fact that I even tried it is insane to me. Um, so, yeah, doing that, doing Montreal, um, you know, I think the fact that I just do it is crazy and weird. So I've been very lucky. But definitely the Kind of Funny show was one of the huge standouts of my career. All right, and do you have any advice for people that are looking into getting into stand-up yeah. or writing as a journalist or uh, sure. just anything along those lines? Just uh, just start doing it if you can. Find, you know, if you're trying to do stand-up, you know, find a local club. Or if you're in college, find, you know, a group that's doing it. Or just put on a show yourself. People will come out. If there's no stand-up in your town and you put on a show, people are going to see it just because it doesn't exist there. 
Uh, bars are a great place to do, if you're over 21, obviously, but bars are a great place to hold stand-up shows just because they often want people coming in on, like, a Tuesday. Um, so just start doing it. Same with writing. Just start doing it. I mean, you know, I always say, like, my, you know, my parents are great and I'm glad that they raised me but they're not rich you know they don't have connections they're not you know they're not they weren't in the business when I started you know I grew up in Florida um, I just you know started doing it and then kept doing it until I made a little bit of money then a little bit more and then that was what my living was All right, well uh, thank you for coming on and yeah, of course. is there any uh, final thoughts that you would like to give or um, uh, where people can find you once again yeah, you can find me on Twitch and Twitter at Mike Drucker, M-I-K-E-D-R-U-C-K-E-R. Uh, also, please listen to How to Be a Person. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, a few other places. And also, watch The Tonight Show. It's on NBC. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, once again, thank you for coming on. And thank, thank everyone you. that stayed and watched the entire video. There will be links to everything that has to do with Mike Drucker in the description below, Twitter, uh, iTunes, SoundCloud, everything else. So once again, thank you and thank, thank you, you for all having for watching. Me.